Oh, all right. Q and A time. It's been a little while. It's been a little while. Uh, I've been super, super busy over the last couple of months. And so, you know, I haven't had a chance to chat with you guys because I've been moving into this new apartment and business is picking up and I've had a whole bunch of client work and all this kind of stuff. So thought it'd be nice to reconnect. We can do so through video now. So last week I asked on Instagram if you guys had any questions and got a whole bunch back and we're gonna go through some of those today. Sorry if we don't get to yours uh, in particular this time around, but I'm sure next time we will. Let's get into it. John Lincolns asks, when given a creative brief or project to create work for, what's the first thing that you do? I reverse brief in most cases. <laughs> uh, I do that because um, oftentimes when agencies, when companies, when brands brief you on specific work, uh, they've missed something almost every single time. Um, and the biggest thing when you're connecting with another entity to create something is to have the same level of like expectations and the same level of understanding as each other. So oftentimes I'm reverse briefing and giving my interpretation of what I think the brief to be uh, so that they can you know approve that as well. And then, you know, within that reverse brief, I'll make sure to voice any concerns or, you know, uh, express any bits and pieces that they might have missed when they were initially briefing me, just so that we're all on the same page and we all have a very even uh, start and a good foundation to work from. From there, it's always about vision. Uh, what is the vision of the project? What is the vision of the, the deliverables, of the, the campaign, whatever it is? Uh, and then I'll work out how to do it from there. Next one, again, CS1. I'm gonna butcher a whole bunch of your usernames in this video, I'm so sorry. But the question is, what difficulties did you face when you started your photography career? Uh, for me personally, it was, you know, I came from a background that was very involved with visual design. So I started in graphic design, uh, I did product design for the last 10 years. And, you know, so I knew, I knew a lot about vision and I, I knew a lot about composition and those kind of things. And for me specifically, my problem was like, okay, how do I translate my vision into the real world through a camera? So a lot of my first initial difficulties were uh, technical, were finding out about gear and finding out the best ways to shoot and, you know, settings and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that, that's what I focused on first and, um, yeah. Luca Zek asks, do you ever have a creative block and or no motivation to shoot? And if so, how do you deal with it? Uh, great question. I think we are all susceptible as creatives to getting, you know, uh, motivation blocks. Um, but for me specifically, when I have a lack of motivation, I recognize it as a lack of momentum. Uh, and what I mean by that is, Usually if I don't feel like doing something, it's probably because I haven't done it in a while. And that happens with a whole bunch of different things. It happens with, you know, going out to shoot physically. It happens with going to edit your photos or creating something. Um, and so for me, when I have no motivation to shoot or create, I know it's about momentum and I know that I need to just make steps in the right direction and eventually the motivation will come on its own. So do something small and just step towards it. Um, you know, today maybe, you know, take one photo, tomorrow takes two photos, take three photos the next day and so on and so forth. Uh, and once you start to build momentum, you'll find that motivation just kind of just takes care of itself. That's my, that's what happens for me anyway. The next one is from my friend, Georgia Risa. When are you coming back to Tokyo? The next flight back to Japan from Sydney to Australia, I'm there. I don't care how much it is. I don't care who it's with, whatever. I'm there. Uh, and I'm gonna spend like maybe two or three months there uh, as soon as I get back, as soon as I can. I have no idea when that's going to be. Like, Australia is doing pretty well at the moment in terms of like the numbers and all that kind of stuff. But other places and other countries in the world aren't doing so well, so who knows? I have high hopes for before the Olympics next year, mid next year, if that's even gonna keep going on. But uh, I don't know, as soon as I can. 
The next one is from Thick Toast. I like Thick Toast too. How focused were you on producing results on social media through your photography? Uh, early on, like a lot. Um, so the way I see it is, you know, when you're taking photographs and when you're trying to produce good work, there's like the stuff that you like, right? The stuff that speaks to you as a, as a photographer, as a creator. But then there's also stuff that does well and performs well on social media. The stuff that's like popular to the masses. And so for me, what I was focusing on when I first got started was, okay, what's the like the Venn diagram of those two things? How can I like produce work that is authentic and amazing to me, but it also be, you know, somewhat acceptable to the general zeitgeist of who's on social media, right? So in the start, that's what I was focused on. For the first couple of years, you know, I really wanted to grow my account. Um, and I'm not ashamed of saying that, like, it is a very deliberate and laborious task to do, especially when you're first starting out. So, you know, I, I make no reservations that that is a, it's a, it's a hard hill to, to climb and, and one that you have to do so deliberately. Next one is from HPS94. Is living in Japan mentally tough? I'd love to go and stay for six to 12 months at some stage. Well, the answer is yes, but you should do it anyway. Uh, you know, for me personally, living in Japan was tough, um, but the pros greatly outweigh the cons. And you'll learn over time, like the little annoyances that bug you the most about living in Japan. Uh, for me, it was stuff like regulations and laws and, and all that kind of stuff when it came to like visas and moving in and um, <laughs> key money and renting apartments and, and that whole jam. But Again, like the positives outweigh the negatives and you should just do it anyway as an experience, 100%. Okay, so the next one's from Sam LC Visuals. How do you feel about large amounts of photo manipulation, sky replacements, etc.? Oh man, this is a huge topic. One that I could easily spend like an entire 10 minutes talking about, right? But my general stance is this, there's two kind of things that we're talking about here. There's photography and then there's digital art, right? So for me, where photography ends and digital art begins is when you start adding things to the image that wasn't there like for real in real life, right? So for me personally, like I have been using Photoshop since I was like 13 years old. Um, and I still keep my skills sharp today, like to this day. For me personally, I remove, you know, distractions. So like random rocks on the ground or like pieces of garbage that you wouldn't want in an image, right? Um, or maybe I'm like gently touching up someone's face in a portrait or something like that. But for me, that's, that's, that's it. That's as far as I personally go when, when I think about what pure photography is, right? For me personally, anything after that, is digital art. And you know, that means adding silhouettes. It means adding stars into a, an image. It means adding skies. It means changing the general look of an image to something that wasn't a, you know, a, a calling to the original scene in real life. That for me is digital art. And don't get me wrong, I have a background in graphic design. That's, that's where I got my start. And so things like digital art are and have been a huge inspiration to me in my work throughout my you know, entire career, not just photography, but you know, my entire career as you know, a product designer as well. So I have a really big appreciation for digital art. My problem is when one masquerades as the other. And specifically, I'm talking about like when digital art masquerades as photography, right? Both are imagery, both are images, right? But one is not like the other. And again, I love digital art and I love photography, but I think labels are important, right? I think when you're creating something that's digital art, you should call it as such. When things are a photograph, it's obviously a photograph, right? But I think where it becomes a problem is because when you don't label things correctly, as digital art, people have an expectation of reality, right? People expect 
things to be real when they're quite simply not. This is a huge, huge problem in the travel industry, which is where I work, right? As a travel photographer, where there's an expectation of you going to a particular place and achieving a particular result when it comes to photography. But if you're influenced by digital art and something that doesn't actually exist in reality, and you go to a location expecting that result and don't get it, there's a lot of implications for that. You know, things like, you know, not being satisfied with a place or like the idea of being lied to and, and a whole bunch of other things, right? I think integrity and honesty uh, in your work, especially when it comes to labeling it, is really important. Uh, but again, I can like dig into this on a you know, 10, 20 minute uh, video because I just, I have so much to say, but let's just leave it at that for now. Next question is from Marie M. Mandor. Is Japan an expensive country? Yes, yes it is. Uh, <laughs> but you know, is it more expensive than say where I'm living in Sydney or more expensive than, you know, some other countries in the world like in Canada or, or, or elsewhere? I mean, it's, it's, it's very similar in terms of like any other first world country, right? Uh, for me specifically, I found that like renting and staying and uh, everything to do with like accommodation in Japan is just a little bit more expensive than what it is here in Sydney, for example. Uh, but conversely, food and everything, you know, shopping related and all that kind of stuff is much cheaper in Japan than it is for me here in Sydney. So it's kind of relative depending on where you're living and you know what your standards are and, and what type of country you're in. All right, the next one from Arthur or Artiles. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Would you go for it if you had a very good opportunity to move to Japan? Yes, but like so many things would need to line up in order for me to actually take that plunge. So for example, you know, visas are really difficult to come by when it comes to a visa that's gonna last you longer than like a year or two, right? So firstly, I would need to be hired by a company, have a visa for like at least three years, uh, have a working salary that was like really competitive, have a job that enabled me to do whatever I wanted to do, much like I'm doing right now, uh, a whole bunch of different things like, I'm not expecting any of those things to happen. And to be honest, even if they did, it would still take me a lot of thought and a lot of consideration for me to even, you know, think about taking that plunge. But I mean, you never know, you never know, right? So leave the opportunity open. Next question is from Mataman. Are you a full-time creator or do you have another job? Yes, I am a full-time creator. I own my own business and that sustains me throughout my journey of being a creator. Uh, it's only in the past just a little bit over a year that I made the full-time plunge and uh, decided to work for myself. So yeah, I mean, terrible timing, but it is what it is. It's still, it's still working, so it's fine. Next one's from Quinn No Photo. How is the new apartment treating you? Any future upgrades on the horizon? Uh, the new apartment is great. I'm loving this new place. It's taken me a long time to set everything up the way I want to because, you know, I, I started with nothing. So last year, if you didn't know already, last year when I made the jump to be a full-time photographer, I sold everything. And so like when I returned this year, I literally only had a suitcase to come home to and I had to buy everything <laughs> uh, again. And so it took a little bit longer than expected, but you know, it, it's worth it and it's slowly getting there. And I will have probably two more apartment videos to come. Uh, one about like the process of, of making everything and then I'll do a final one, which is like a, a detail and like a, you know, a nice, a really nice video about explaining all of the little bits of the studio and the apartment and all that kind of stuff. The next one's from Origami Fire. How do you get started asking models to collaborate? So the thing with this one is, from my experience, models, like the biggest thing about it is, like models are concerned of, about like, you know, collaborating with people that one, aren't, like skillful or good, but two, 
aren't creeps, right? Because there's a lot of like suspect behavior and like creepy behavior out there. And I think whatever you can do to mitigate those two points is, is, is great before you start reaching out to models. So for example, if you had an Instagram profile and you were like, you know, sliding into DMs to try and uh, like ask models to collaborate with them, um, make sure that your feed looks like you have, uh, you know, firstly are good at portraiture, um, but secondly are actually interested in taking photos in a portrait sense, right? And that you're not just a creep because I think that's really important. You know, it, there's no credibility behind looking at someone who wants to do a portrait shoot, but then has no portraits to show, right? And if you're at that stage, then it's as simple as, you know, getting your friends to model for you so that you can start to build a portfolio, right? There, there are people in your life that you will have that you can use to start making steps in that direction so that you can build your credibility towards, you know, having a better uh, presence when you're asking models to collaborate with them. Piso Igim, how much are the ones who don't play Genshin Impact missing out? You're missing out a lot. <laughs> nah, Genshin's awesome um, and it's free, so go for it. The next one is by Paul Pington. What is your daily coffee routine, brewing equipment, favorite coffee roaster, etc.? Uh, so in the mornings, I will brew like two of these in the same pot, uh, just cause I'm a massive coffee fiend and I need that much coffee in the morning, <laughs> otherwise I can't get up. Uh, in terms of like uh, kettle, I'm using the Stag uh, and grinder, I'm using the Bratio Encore. When it comes to roasters and coffee and that kind of stuff, recently I've just been going around the entire city and just finding different places and, and different uh, beans to try from uh, because there's so many options, so many fantastic options in Sydney. This particular one is Toby Estate. They do like a signature range uh, for filters and for single origins. So it's been really nice so far. Hey J Cruz asks RX 107 or ZV1. RX100 if you're gonna go photos, ZV1 if you're gonna go video. Although both of them do both of them equally as well. It's just one has like a flippy side screen and the other has a flippy top screen. Uh, and then depending on how much zoom you want, you know, the one has a 2470 and the other one has a 24200. So uh, do that. I love my RX100 personally uh, and I use it every day for photos. So your mileage may vary. So it just depends on what you really wanna use it for. Black is peg, tea or coffee, both. <laughs> I usually have, so back to my, my coffee routine, uh, I usually have two of these in the morning and then follow that straight up with like a black tea or something like that, that I can like gently sip across the day. And then at night, I never drink coffee, I'm always drinking tea. So something that's maybe a little bit herbal, uh, just something to like bring me down and, and all that kind of stuff. So both. Next one is from Aqua Arieta. What should beginning photographers prioritize learning first versus learning over time? This is a great question. Uh, and it's very simple from my perspective. The thing you should be learning is vision. Hands down, vision. I think for me, you know, that's what defines a good photographer. The ability to, to use visual language, to communicate what you're seeing into the real world. I think that is the defining feature of what makes a good photographer. It's not the gear, it's not the place, it's not the position, it's not the settings. It, you know, it is exactly the, what is up here and how that's translated into reality. So work on that. To so work on things like visual language and understanding, you know, all the different components of, of what comes along with that. Things like visual hierarchy, things like juxtaposition, things like, you know, solid composition techniques and all that kind of stuff. I have a lot of uh, resources on my website about this, paquet.com. Check it out if you want to read it. Uh, but yeah, definitely vision is the biggest thing. So the next one is from D1 Chris. Where do you usually search for inspiration? So not on Instagram. That's the number one thing for me personally. For me personally, it's about like going outside the realm of comfort, taking something that is 
compelling to you and then bringing it into your work and presenting it in, in the space, right? Uh, I, I think for me personally, you know, your inspirations have to have directionality and intentionality behind them. So for me, I am hugely inspired by anime, which is why a lot of my images are soft. They're gentle, they're nostalgic. They have this like sort of ephemeral feeling, right? Uh, and I get a lot of that from anime because I love that nostalgic feel and that's how I choose to bring it in. I think when you're looking for inspirations, don't just copy people and their visual styles just willy-nilly. You know, there's a reason or there should be a reason behind why people do the things that they do or at least like the more mature photographers who have been in the game for a little while and had a lot of time to think about that, right? Um, be intentional about the inspirations that you bring in and go far and wide, 100%, but when you bring them into your work, give them meaning so that you can then enhance your work greater than the next person along that's just riding the next trend or like, you know, just copying a visual style of someone else, right? Have intentionality behind it. The next one is from Sue Ichi. In posting your feed, how do you be consistent with your style? Are you bored? Uh, for me personally, my style and the way I think about style is that style is more of a function of how we shoot and what we shoot rather than what it looks like at the end, rather than the, the visual treatment and the visual aesthetic that you give it at the end, right? So in terms of feed, you know, generally it's light dark blue. That's kind of the visual aesthetic portion of it, right? But when it comes to style for me, I'm always shooting minimal. I'm always shooting simple. I'm always shooting strong subjects all the time. And that's just my style. And I never get bored of that specifically. I get bored of the general like visual aesthetic of it sometimes. You know, sometimes being blue all the time is kind of limiting. Uh, but I have other avenues in which to express myself so that I don't get bored with this one particular look of the feed, especially when it comes to, to Pat K on the feed, right? So I think for me, like there's a projection of a particular vibe that I want because after all, my Instagram is, yeah, it's a reflection of me, but it's also a business as well. And so I'm really cognizant about the way I present myself uh, when it comes to that feed. So consistency is a huge thing. Uh, and that is a visual aesthetic that's both, you know, authentic to me, but also visually appealing to, to other people as well. Next one is from Chu V Chase. What is your love and hate relationship with Japan? <laughs> uh, so things I love, the people and my friends there and, you know, staying in places that are a little bit unconventional and, you know, just the general culture and, being able to have any type of photographic experience there, um, enjoying all the foods there. Uh, I mean, there's so many, right? In terms of the things that I hate about or dislike, I mean, hate's a pretty strong word, but dislike about Japan, the government, uh, laws and regulations, the side of culture that is very like overly conformist, right? Uh, I hate the xenophobia because there's a lot of that. Um, I hate that they still use fax machines and cash and business cards. And yeah, I mean, those are all really trivial things, right? But <laughs> there's something, uh, but it's mostly love. It's Vivil, I'm so sorry, Vivel, Viv, Vivil. What pushed you to leave your corporate job and do this full time? So, I was fortunate to be able to start my career way before my friends of my age. Uh, I didn't do any tertiary study. I didn't go to uni or college or anything like that. I've been self-taught the entire way through and that's just the way I love it. So I got to start my career way before everyone else and after a decade of doing product design, I was ready for a different challenge. I wanted something different. I wanted to pursue something that was foreign to me, but still familiar and, you know, push myself in a different direction in the knowledge that if I failed at this photography thing, then I could always just go back to product design anyway. And it's a, it's a skill that translates to many fields 
in the areas that I'm currently working in. So it's been a good transition and I didn't even see it as being that far different to what I was previously doing anyway. But um, yeah, that's the reason why. Next one is from MU4H. Do you have a photography course? Well, uh, not yet, but I'm actually going to be releasing one in the first few months of next year. That's actually going to be my focus for the next year going forward. So now that I've done presets and books, uh, my next thing is courses. So my first one that I'm going to be releasing very soon is a full on like Lightroom masterclass from A to Z. Uh, teaching me everything about like the fundamentals, you know, intermediate techniques, and then all the way up to like advanced creative edits and how to get the most out of Lightroom in a single program. So that's what I'm gonna be doing. Look out for that. It's uh, pretty exciting. That's one of the reasons why I decided to move into this new place so that I could like get this content out and make it as professional and as you know, high quality as possible. Next one is from Sarah Garnum. Did you study? Nope self-taught the entire way through and I always have been and I always will be. That's just, I hate classrooms. I can't, I can't, it's not that I can't sit down. I can sit down and like, you know, learn something. I just feel that it's always inefficient. I feel that I'm always able to learn things faster when I dissect them and then go and attack them in my own way rather than someone else telling me the way to do that, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I'm, I've always been self-taught. Axel C, uh, tips for growing on Instagram for photographers. This is again like a, a topic I could easily spend 10 minutes talking about in a, you know, in a video. Uh, but again, coming back to the idea of like, um, the things that speak to you and are authentic to you when you're creating them and the things that are like popular in the zeitgeist of social media today, you know, what is the Venn diagram of those two things in the middle? Focus on that, find that, and then just take it and run like hell with it and work your butt off. Do that for, you know, years and years and you'll, you'll get there. There's no real like short tactics uh, that work in the long run that will get you this growth, right? The, the single foundation of you growing is predicated on the quality of content that you bring out and how well it resonates with the, the mainstream, the, the people on social media. So yeah, it takes a lot of work there, you know. <laughs> Good luck to ya. Next one was from Imp Stand. Imp Stand, S-T, N-D, I'm sorry. <laughs> Again, I'm so sorry. Have you always known photography was your passion? Nope. Um, so again, like my, my previous uh, career was as a product designer and I only picked up a camera four or five years ago. So, it was only then when I first started photography that I realized it was my passion. Before that, you know, I was like taking pictures on like a, a shitty GoPro, right? Like photography wasn't really a thing for me, even though, you know, the aspects of visual language and graphic design were. So yeah, it was, it's, it's a pretty new thing. Okay, so the next one is from Ryan Laws 29 Are you Japanese? Nope, I'm actually Malaysian. And I was born in Malaysia, but I've lived in Australia for the majority of my life. Uh, it's only recently in the last couple of years that I've built up an unhealthy obsession with Japan. So, hee <laughs> hee. All right, and the last one for today is from Glenn Seven. What are your top tips on being able to work with brands? This one's interesting and another long uh, long potential conversation to have, but to sum it up, have work that's worthy of being able to work with that brand, right? I think a lot of the times uh, displaying your portfolio and the level of like confidence that a brand might have for your work and how you know, you're able to execute on their brand is a really important and, and really fundamental uh, decision when it comes to who to pick for you know someone to execute on on a piece of work right so make sure that your work is good enough for that brand if you don't have a portfolio and you want to work with a specific brand on a specific let's say like a, a product shot for a phone or something like that right 
if you've got no uh, portfolio to prove that you can do that job, then you're not gonna get hired for it just from the get-go, right? So create a portfolio of you know, your work so that you can prove to brands that you can do the job. That's what it really boils down to, this level of like confidence that you know, the work is going to be good. So try that. All right, so that's it. That's all for this Q&A this time around. If I didn't get to your questions, I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm sure we will next time. So look out for the next time we do a Ask Me Anything on my Instagram. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.